Vamos fazer uma ligação em direto aos Estados Unidos para falar com o David Otter. Lá está. David, greetings from Lisbon, Portugal. Hope you're doing well. Fantastic to have your participation here in our event discussing the future of the Portuguese economy and the opportunities that are there for all of us. I believe your presentation is called Shaping the Future of Work. So with no further ado, I give the stage over to you. Thank you uh, very much. It is, it's an honor to be here. I very much wish I could be here in person. I'm hoping you're able to see my slides now. Ah, great. All right, wonderful. Uh, great, I'm gonna speak to you about uh, shaping the future of work as it relates to Portugal, uh, which is a, a wonderful country. I wish I could be there today. I've been there many times and I look forward to uh, visiting again soon. So um, let me begin. Uh, there is a, a widely articulated concern that automation is rendering human labor unnecessary. This is a well stated by the economist Daniel Susskind in 2020, who said machines will not do everything in the future, but they will do more. And as they slowly but relentlessly take on more and more tasks, human beings will be forced to retreat to an ever shrinking set of activities. And this idea has a long pedigree. Uh, the Nobel laureate Vasily Leontiev wrote in 1983 that progressive introduction of new computerized and automated and robotized equipment will render people uh, like horses, uh, unnecessary. Um, I, but uh, it's useful to realize that um, despite two centuries of automation, in fact, we are still hard at work in most industrial countries the share of the adult population working in the paid labor force has risen, not declined over the last 125 years, mostly because of women uh, entering the paid labor force, uh, moving out of uh, restricted, um, unpaid work in the household. Um, and so despite all of our advances in technology, so far we have not run out of work. That's important starting point to bear in mind. So why haven't we run out of work? Why are there still so many jobs? I'm gonna talk about three contributors. Two of them you probably already know well. And the third one I think will be, I hope will be novel and interesting where I'm gonna talk about the creation of new work. But let me first start with the ones that you're already familiar with. The first is insatiability. The idea that we never get enough. That's what we'll illustrate in this picture. Uh, this is a photograph of the Caven family and all of their material possessions in California in 1985. Uh, so they agreed to let a photographer and a moving company empty their house onto the lawn. And you can see that in addition to uh, the husband and wife and their children, uh, they have numerous bicycles, books, televisions, appliances, uh, uh, baby toys, uh, chairs, um, uh, couches, etc. Um, and so uh, an amazing amount of stuff. And I remind you, this photograph is nearly 40 years old. So if we were to do the same with a, a contemporary Portuguese or American household, uh, I think you would find even more things. So what does that tell you? It says that as we get wealthier, our material needs, or at least our perceived material needs, tend to rise in proportion to our wealth. We consume more. And as we consume more, that tends to create more work for others. So one reason we don't get at, run out of work as we get wealthier is because uh, we spend our money, we don't save it, and that creates work for others. But there's a second reason. Uh, many people uh, are focused on what is being automated, and that's a legitimate thing to be concerned about. Many tasks are automated. We no longer dig ditches by hand. We don't pound tools out of rod iron. We don't do bookkeeping using books anymore. We use computers. So many things are being automated. But it's not just that machines replace us. They also augment us. They make us more effective and more valuable. So if you are a uh, working in the medical field, uh, there are now numerous tests uh, that allow you to diagnose the patient. Now, some of those tests save you time, things that you would have done uh, more slowly uh, if you didn't have modern equipment. But they also allow you to make better diagnoses, to discover diseases that you didn't know about, to learn about the condition of a patient and therefore uh, to do better treatment. So it's not just saving time, it's increasing the value that a doctor adds. 
but it doesn't have to be just in medicine. Uh, if you are a roofer, having a pneumatic hammer, pneumatic nail gun, allows you to accomplish far more work in the course of a day and arguably to, uh, to uh, do more complex jobs more quickly. So that increases the value. It doesn't make you unnecessary, it makes you more productive. Or if you're an architect or designer, having access to computerized drafting tools allows you to use your imagination more effectively and to, and to do engineering calculations and figure out what will stand and what will not and what needs to be changed at a much greater rate. So much less time is spent on kind of uh, calculation and more time on inspiration and creativity. This is also true if you're a teacher. For those of us who educate, we know that uh, the online classroom is not simply a video recording of a lecture we'd give in person, but a different way to reach more people using more tools. It makes education more productive. Or if you are a trucker, having access to routing software allows you to compete with or participate in networks without ever having an empty load in your truck. You always know where to go uh, and when you'll get there. So in all these ways, these tools don't simply replace us, they make our skills more valuable. They increase the value of our judgment, our expertise, our creativity, and our flexibility. But now let me talk about the third point, and this is really the focus of my talk today, which is new work, novel demands for human specialization, for expertise that didn't previously exist. This shows you US employment in 1940. There are about 45 million workers in the US workforce. This line shows you US employment in 2018 in the jobs that existed in 1940. This figure shows you all of US employment in 2018. What that tells you is about two thirds of the work done in the United States in 2018 is in jobs that didn't exist in 1940, activities that weren't being done at all. In other words, two thirds of work today is new work that had, was invented in the last 80 years. Now you might have in mind, what do I mean by new work? What am I talking about? <laughs> Let me try to give you a few examples. Let's say you go to the doctor. There are some timeless tasks your doctor asks you about stress, exercise, alcohol use. Uh, he or she hits your knee with a hammer to test your reflexes. There are some tasks that have been automated, uh, checking your blood oxygen, your heart rate, considering drug interactions. Those are mostly done by machines now. They take much less labor. There are new tasks. Here are new jobs that have been created in this field uh, in recent decades. A diagnostic radiologist, a pharmacist technician, a mammographer, these are all new areas of expertise that weren't present uh, 50 years ago. Let me give you another example. If you are a fitness trainer, there are some timeless tasks, grunting, sweating, the agony and the ecstasy, as they say in the Olympics. There are tasks that are now automated. Uh, all these measuring tasks, timekeeping, heart rate, pace. There's also equipment adjustments, resistance, weight, all done by machines. Here are new jobs that have been added in the last 30 years, a sports psychologist, a sports nutritionist, a certified therapeutic recreational specialist. Uh, these are all new, uh, new demands for skills. I'll give you one more example. Let's say you're doing marketing research. There are timeless tasks. You form a hypothesis, you propose analysis, you stare at the results, you give up in frustration, you start again. That's research. There are tasks that are now done by machines, uh, estimating models, testing significance, generating tables and figures. Here are some new jobs that have been created in this field since 1980. An applied statistician, a director of marketing research and analysis, a data visualization developer. All new work. In fact, if we look across the US economy, this figure shows you all US occupations in broad categories, arranged from typically lowest paying to typically highest paying, so from agriculture and farming to managerial work. The blue bar shows you employment in 1940. The green and red bar show you employment in 2018. And the red piece is what is new. So you can see in 1940, most work was in farming and mining and in production. Today, 80 years later, not only is a smaller share of work done in those categories, but a smaller number of people work in those occupations. What has grown instead? Managers, professionals, 
technical workers, sales workers, clerical and administrative workers, and personal service workers, people who help other people. And most of that employment is in the red bars, new things that have been created in the intervening 80 years, new work. Okay, so let me tell you where I'm going. Uh, there are four messages that I wanna to convey to you in the remaining 15 minutes. First of all, technological innovations both augment and automate human labor. They do opposing things. We can measure and distinguish these forces. Two, it's not just technology. Demand forces themselves shape where new work appears. When demand contracts, they discourage the creation of new work. I don't just mean the creation of jobs, I mean the creation of new forms of work. When demand expands, this fosters new work creation. Uh, it matters not just whether we innovate, but how and where we innovate. Do we automate or do augment? Where, which occupations are augmented? Which ones are automated? Um, so it's not just if, but where. Finally, the future of work is a work in progress. The jobs we get depend in part on the investments we make. This is very relevant to Portugal and the institutions that turn productivity into prosperity. So at the end, I will talk about that specifically. But let me step back, just tell you how do we measure new work and how do we know that it's important? So um, here are some examples of new work. These are jobs that were added to the US census uh, in the last 80 years. And let me explain, the census keeps a list of what people write in when they report their industry and occupation. And when new things appear, they enter them into kind of a catalog and they keep them from decade to decade. So that's how we see these new things emerging. So in 1940, a new job was an automatic welding machine operator. In 1960, that might be a textile chemist. In 1980, that might be a controller of a drone or an artificial intelligence specialist in 2000 or a pediatric vascular surgeon in 2018. So you look at this list and you say, ah, I get it. New work is about technology, people who use new tools, create new tools, install new tools, sell new tools, uh, uh, you know, and integrate them into other specialties. Here's another list of things, excuse me, added in the same time period. Tattooers, mental health counselors in 1970, conference planners in 1990, uh, amusement park workers, uh, sommeliers, those are people who sell you wine at restaurants. Um, many of these are not technological in nature, they just refer to changing tastes and they reflect a changing income, changing demographics and age structure, and the changing health of the population. In fact, as much new work is created in these categories that are not technological as in these technology intensive categories. So that's important. Not all new work has to do with technology or machines. Um, and let me just skip that slide in the interest of time. But one thing we can see, this shows you the relationship between the emergence of these new titles on the x-axis, those new types of jobs like sommeliers or remote pilots and remotely controlled vehicles, and on the vertical axis, the growth of employment. So what we can see is occupations that are growing have many new titles emerging within them or vice versa, where new titles emerge, work is growing. And so that's just kind of a descriptive fact. It doesn't tell you what's causing what, but it tells you that new work is likely to be important. So now I wanna tell you how we kind of get some more details on this. We want to distinguish between what I said, augmentation and automation. Augmentation is adding value to existing worker tasks. The way we measure augmentation is we actually use the descriptions of the outputs of occupations from these same historical documents. We look at what they claim to do and we look for patents, new innovations that describe that type of work. So whether that's an ambulance driver or a mechanic or a physician's aid or a prosthetic limb installer, we look for new innovations that, that claim, that, that mention these activities, uh, these jobs, and we assume that effectively those, or we hope those innovations describe added value, improvements in the services or the range of things that can be done. So that's how we try to measure augmentation. Automation conversely is substituting worker tasks with machines. We try to measure that in patents as well. We use descriptions of the detailed inputs, the tasks that workers accomplish in their jobs. And we look for patents that claim to do those same tasks. So 
in both cases, we're using the records of all U.S. patent or all, pat all patents recorded in the United States from 1940 to the present and looking for ones that appear to augment occupations and the ones that automate the tasks done by workers within those occupations. Turns out those things are pretty correlated. Auto occupations that are exposed to a lot of automation tend to be exposed to a lot of augmentation and vice versa. For example, childcare workers aren't exposed to much augmentation or automation. Uh, operators of power plants are exposed to a lot of both, but there are important differences. So for example, if we look at cabinet makers and bench carpenters, they appear to be exposed to a lot of automation, but not much augmentation, which makes us think that they that work will tend to shrink. If we instead look at um, mechanical engineers, uh, we see that they are exposed to a lot of augmentation, but not so much automation, which makes us think that those might grow. So let me talk specifically about how we do this. There are really three ideas that we try to test in the data, and I'll describe them very briefly and then go to their implications. Uh, the first uh, one we want to look for uh, is uh, whether uh, we see the emergence of new types of jobs in occupations and categories that are exposed to more augmentation. So we look for these augmentation patents, and then we ask whether we see new types of work emerging in the occupations that are exposed to that. And the answer is yes. If you look at blue collar work, like agriculture or production work, or you look at uh, professional and information jobs like management or clerical administrative support, if you look at personal services like health services or cleaning and protective services, or if you look at commercial services like finance or technicians, fire and police or transportation, or even uh, just looking at all 12 together, those, all those major categories I put up earlier, in the detailed categories in which we see new augmentation patterns being introduced that augment human labor, we see new work emerging, new titles that didn't previously exist, like those uh, sommeliers or those um, pilots of remotely controlled vehicles. Now you might say, well, is that just true of all innovations? Is this just, would you find the same thing for automation patents? And the answer is no. It really is something specific about augmentation. Automation does not predict the emergence of new titles. Automation predicts the emergence of new tasks for machines, but not new tasks for workers. So these really are distinctive. Similarly, I made the point earlier that it's not just technology, it's also changes in the demand for work that creates specialization. So uh, for example, uh, many countries, including the United States and Portugal, were exposed to a large trade shock coming from China's remarkable rise as a manufacturing power. In the United States, as China's imports to the US grew, US manufacturing employment contracted very rapidly. And so in our analysis, we ask, do we see a slowdown in the creation of new work in the occupations in which the China shock, the con demand contraction was especially large? And again, I wanna emphasize not the slowdown of job creation, of course, job creation expands or slows, but the, the slowdown in the creation of new types of work that didn't previously exist. And the answer is yes. Uh, in the occupations most exposed to the China trade shock, not only does employment contract, but the emergence of new types of work slows. And it turns out that's specific to that period. If we look in the earlier decades before the China shock in those same occupations, we do not see that phenomenon. So again, we can see that uh, uh, where demand contracts, uh, new work slows. And conversely, where we invest, uh, we see new types of work, new specialization, new demands for human skills emerging. Um, uh, finally, uh, final point on this, and then I'll move to the kind of um, uh, uh, summarizing remarks. Um, we, the other thing we want to say is, well, sure, new titles, more or less, that's fine. But do we actually see an increase in total employment uh, where augmentation is occurring? Do we see a decline in employment where automation is occurring? And the answer is yes. On the left-hand side, I show you the relationship between augmentation patents, new innovations, and the growth of employment in occupations, holding constant automation. 
On the right-hand side, I show you the relationship between the contraction of employment in those same occupations and the rise of automation, holding augmentation constant. And you can see that both forces are present. Where augmentation is occurring, employment is growing. Where automation is occurring, employment is contracting. They are often happening in the same place. Let me summarize these points and then I'll draw some conclusions. First, new work, as I emphasized at the beginning, is quantitatively important. More than 60% of US employment in 2018 is in job titles that did not yet exist in 1940. I don't have the identical data for Portugal, but I imagine something similar is present. Innovation predicts where new job types emerge. New titles emerge where innovations complement labor's outputs, where it augments. New titles don't emerge where innovations uh, aug automate labor's inputs. Uh, innovation is only part of the story. Conventional supply and demand forces are key. New work is driven by changing tastes, by wealth, by demographics, by globalization. It emerges and accelerates uh, where we invest. These forces affect where new work emerges, where employment shrinks and grows, and what skills are demanded. So now let me step back and talk about shaping the future of work in the remaining five minutes. I had the privilege to serve as one of the co-directors of the MIT Task Force on the Work of the Future. And we looked in particular at five different types of technology and their impacts, autonomous vehicles, industrial robotics, intelligent supply chains, additive manufacturing, and artificial intelligence. And I can summarize our conclusions in a single sentence, which is that mo the momentous impacts of technological change are unfolding gradually. So two key words, one, momentous. These are really important. They will change the way we transport people, the way we build things, the way we uh, move things from place to place, the way we accomplish many tasks. They are transformative, but they're moving slowly. Many of them take decades to have an impact. And many of the impacts that we feel right now, uh, now stem from technologies that were introduced decades earlier. So there is time to take advantage of them and to shape them in the directions that we want. They will affect our work, but they are, uh, they are tools uh, that we are introducing now and in which we will have many, many years to, uh, to shape to our advantage. So the jobs that we get depend on the investments we make, and that relates to these new technologies. This figure shows you the changing shape of innovation over 120 years, um, where this is uh, the distribution of patents across major categories. The things on the left show you categories of innovation that have slowed transportation, manufacturing processes, lighting, heating, uh, nuclear power, engineering, construction, and mining, consumer goods and entertainment, and agriculture and food. On the right are things that have become much more important, instruments and information, health, electricity and electronics, and chemistry, at least in the earlier part of the 20th century. So in fact, these categories on the right, instruments and information and electricity and electronics encompass more than half of all innovations happening since 1980. That's important because those affect different occupations. As those information innovations have become more important, they've had a much larger effect on professionals and technicians and managers, workers in health, workers in sales and clerical administrative support than they have on these more traditional occupations. So what that shows you is innovation shapes work. And that innovation doesn't happen on its own. It's not just people sitting at a lab bench going, Eureka, I've discovered something. It is a directed economic activity. It is led by incentives, by government investment, by universities, by an, a shared understanding of what the important problems are. So we should recognize that as we invest, we change the work that we will do going forward. Let me give you one concrete example, telepresence. Telepresence is remote control or remote presence in some activity. So this shows you on the left, a underwater telepresent exploring robot used for deep sea exploration. We are now in the middle because of the pandemic, a shift towards telepresence working from home, remote learning, distance medicine, virtual conferences. I am here today telepresently. 
The breakthrough here actually is not a technological one per se, it's actually a coordination problem. The tools that we're using right now have existed for five or 10 years anyway. What's different is that we all agreed because of the pandemic that this is a reasonable means to accomplish our work and to gather and to communicate. Um, so that, so we're entering an age of telebrilliance. Well, how does that affect work? One way that affects work is it's going to reduce business travel. Uh, in the United States, it's estimated that business travel will fall by about 40%. People will travel less to uh, premier cities uh, because they can be there telepresently. Similarly, uh, people, uh, high wage workers will tend to work from home, especially people who previously worked in high density locations. Employers now tend, uh, intend for them to spend more days per week working from home. People who are better paid, they can expect them to spend more days per week working from home. Well, how does that affect innovation? This figure here shows you patents that affect work from home technologies. You can see that a very small percentage of all patents refer to work from home technologies. And then come January of 2020, for the onset of the pandemic, this number uh, increased by about 200%. In other words, all of a sudden, all this innovation is directed at supporting work from home. These are innovations that are gonna make people working from home more productive. They're gonna improve their productivity, their ability to communicate, the ability to coordinate, right? And so you can see right here, the process of shaping the future of work is happening in real time, affected by incentives. In this case, it's going to be particularly beneficial for highly educated workers, we suspect, since they are more likely to be able to deliver their work online. And so that's gonna change. Uh, so we should think about how we can use those same capabilities to augment other workers, not just the highest paid among us. Okay. Let me draw some conclusions about from made in to created in Portugal. Uh, Portugal has unique, compelling strengths, the wonderful country. It has a positive political and policy environment. It has an excellent geographic location. It has a fabulous quality of life. It also has rising skill lo levels and modernized labor market institutions. Portugal, of course, is worried about automation, legitimately. Um, most countries are. It is displacing certain types of work. But technological innovations both augment and automate human labor. And augmentation is also a force that companies and nations can harness. They can build on their comparative advantage, as the Portuguese British economist David Ricardo said over 200 years ago. Um, how do we build on comparative advantage? We invest in areas where we where we have strengths and this fosters new work not just more work but new types of work um, building on those strengths rather than targeting moonshots tends to breed success so to give you a couple of examples uh, 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 harnessing the sea in aquaculture an area where portugal is a leader or excuse me uh, investing in winemaking and cork processes, as is done by APCOR, or um, uh, innovating in design, as is done by the Farfetch Group, or, of course, uh, innovating in maritime services, as is seen in Portugal's leading both uh, industrial and uh, tourist ports. So to summarize, the majority of today's jobs had yet to be invented a century ago. Countries, firms, entrepreneurs, and individuals are inventing the work of the future at this moment. Yes, automation is changing the shape of work, and not always for the better. It is displacing workers doing skilled but repetitive tasks. But augmentation is an equally powerful force that creates opportunity. Portugal can also shape this process building on its longstanding strengths, cultivating skills, attracting visitors and residents, and embracing the winds of change. And here is Portugal embracing the winds of train change in the example of Vestas, uh, the uh, power wind power generation company. Okay. 
thank you very much uh, for inviting me here. It's a pleasure to have an opportunity to speak with you. And I hope next time I will be able to do so in person. Thank you.